anyway, um, first of all, I would all uh, like you to welcome you to my first webinar um, that I called Hans the Great Ask Me Anything webinar. Um, before we move on any further and I present you the table of contents, uh, what this webinar is actually about, I would like first of all to present myself for those of you who don't know me. Um, basically, I'm known on the forums as Hans the Great and I'm 24 years old Croatian IT bachelor. <laughs> well, probably not going to follow for now that career, but still have something to back up on. Um, I speak uh, four languages, Croatian, English, German, and Italian, and as you may, most of you know, I'm up for now a professional poker player and best poker coaching coach. And as you may know, uh, I turned fifty dollars into one hundred k after nine months and one week. Actually, the funny part is that I did not count that, but um, it actually I was told that by my coach, who was the more proud about it. Um, anyway, today I I will do the following. Um, I will do kind of like a fifty dollars into one hundred k dollar challenge recap where. I'm gonna I'm gonna more detail talk about um, the month um, as they came uh, till till the end till I reached the 100k. Um, then I will go over a topic that I frequently get emailed to and what I will do differently if I were to start all over again. Um, this is generally a question that I very frequently got and I think. Uh, some of you that want to maybe take the same path uh, are maybe interested in. Then the third part is going to be the mindset part, um, which I think has nowadays game uh, way, way more higher, um, is way, way more important than um, only the technical part. And the last part, um, as you may have noticed, uh, my coach is as well here, so we're going to hear his thoughts, what's, uh, how he did perceive the whole thing, uh, what he thinks made, made my breakthrough, and so on. And, of course, in the end, um, you guys can as well uh, ask me questions. So I guess we can start. Um, we can do the recap. Um, Basically, that, that's my graph. I hope you guys can see it. We're going to go uh, back to it as, as it comes. Um, it's not the newest because I'm currently on, on a semi-vacation, so I don't have anything by myself, but that's one of the later, latest graphs, and we're going to um, get back to it as, I, as I'm talking about my progress, so we, we can follow up that on the graph. So basically, the first part, challenge recap, um, I started on, I think, November 2, 2013, uh, and that's where I started my cooperation with the coach, Gordon Gago, and we agreed on turning on $50 uh, and do 100K challenge using, in the beginning, a no six, max, no 6 Max bullshit book, which was, for those of you who don't know, which was like a pretty simple a book stating some basic guidelines how to how to play certain type of hands uh, in in a vacuum, not knowing about anything about of uh, about your opponent tendencies or any reads. And the funny part was that we actually <laughs> get with this book, which I was really frustrated in the beginning. I I still even, um, remember my first uh, crying email to Gordon where I cried about. The, the mistake of the book, how it just can't be good, and so on and so forth. How when my L10 shot failed, I was pretty pissed off the book. But the fact is that the book still helped me um, a lot, and I went from L2 up to L50 in like two months. I was playing L50 already by the uh, by the end of 2013, and I was doing fairly decent, and I was actually pretty amazed how far the book and the pretty simplistic strategy that's inside brought me actually to. Um, then 
probably the biggest downswing in my poker career happened, which was January 2014. I was like running below 60 EV, uh, 60 binds below EV, and I became slightly losing player. I still remember the nights when I was like um, so frustrated that. I was like the whole time thinking, should I have check called in that spot? Should I have check raised? I, it, I really started to kind of like became obsessive about turning it around. The good part, and what I'm really glad that Gordon really understood, he never really said anything bad that I'm not not like bring profit, but rather like. Um, I mean, after rake back, we still made some money, but I wasn't like more any more winning player, and it was really probably the hardest time ever in my life. And the worst part is when you like felt you could beat NL50 a month ago, and all of a sudden you go NL20, and you can't beat NL20 after like 30 days. It feels it feels just gross. It, 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 there is probably no no worse feeling. Then um, we decided to change something. Um, we switched to NL50 normal tables, and we worked um, more on specific reads, notes. We kind of started deviating more from this no six box bullshit book, and that's something I generally advise people. Okay, you have the no six max bullshit book. The next step would be okay, no six max bullshit book suggests this. I'll Okay, I think this is wrong in this spot because my opponent has a check raise percentage on the turn. I don't know, example, 18%. So I probably should probably check behind. This is how I started prog progressing more. Of course, um, Nate uh, added, uh, Gordon added the psychological part and how to understand players and so on. So this was like really when I started to find success on the NL50 tables. I still re remember one of the aha effect was like the snap when people just snap push the river without like thinking. That was still one of the most amazing things how uh, what I learned during this coaching period uh, with him how actually effective this can be when you take notes about this. But again, um, I still struggled on L100, mostly because I was the belief as higher as go, people are more and more sick, make, make sicker things, as we like to call. Uh, generally, they play more fancy, which is not really true. That's why we still play um, micros and small stakes. Um, in March, um, I was still struggling on L100, but later I did found success on this limit. It really took me a while to understand it, which spots I can bluff on general, on average, which spots I can do more general value bets and so on. It's still like a whole process combined with February where um, it's, the aha moment is not like combined from only one thing, but it's still like a whole learning curve that happens and reaches his peak at some point, which in my case actually happened in April, where I shot take an L200, and let's be fair and honest, I mean, first, first, um, I think about 30, 40k hands, you hit an L200, a win rate of 15, I don't know, 15 big blinds per 100, which is just sick, so... Thanks to that, I built a bank, pretty decent bankroll, which later afforded me to as well start playing in all 400. But this this month was really the first month with over 10k dollars and winnings, which was I still I think it was 15 to be correct, not not 100 percent sure. Um, next thing we have May 2014. Um, as I said, I'm, during April, I built up a very stable bankroll, which, again, thanks to some good run, I was able to um, take take uh, a place in the NL100 games where I became a sort of like a decent regular. And, again, May was like um, another, another month where I had 10K, over 10K dollars in winnings, so without right back, uh, and it, things were definitely from going pretty good so far. Then again, um, Jul sorry, this is a mistake. Uh, <laughs> it's actually June 2014, um, where the biggest highlight was actually uh, the BPC meeting, 
and but there were no noteworthy results because I think I was trying out to implement some part of my strategy. Um, if you take a look at my graphs, if you have followed the challenge, you see that at some point my my red line just um, skyrocketed rapidly, and my blue line went down. Um, this is probably the period where I experimented um, a bit, attacking more capped ranges and so on. Um, and at that month, I didn't really see the good results, but in June, well, in July actually, <laughs> sorry, uh, I hit the NL600 and 1K tables and won almost 30K to be precise, 29K dollars. And and I had over 20k dollars in winnings uh, from stakes playing from NL100 up to NL1k, which is pretty sick because most of my volume was probably NL200, I think. Not really sure, but I was r running pretty decently on the highest, and probably NL600, extremely hot on NL1k, not that good. But anyway, I was generally running good and. Um, and now this work, what I did in June, um, finally I would say paid out and of course with some decent run um, I was able to um, have definitely an incredible moment of almost winning 30k dollars in one month. Um, next August I just again it's almost the same as um, as July, um, I played the same stakes, made pretty much the same exact amount of money, um, and things were definitely pretty um, getting running to the point where I felt like uh, I settled down, like in the 20k um, dollar area, <laughs> winnings a month. But you know, um, that's probably after the 100k challenge. Uh, I can update it about November, and this November taught me that you're probably gonna have to to be like a regular mid stakes. You're probably gonna have to work on your game um, consistently. It's not like once you found something that works, that's gonna like last forever. Um, so I um, think this month I learned my lesson pretty decently when I hit like a 10k dollar hole but was able to climb back and so it does on it does feel in the beginning it felt like really really weird because you're like used to this 20 30k and so like like after like 10 days you're in the red and and I couldn't actually fall asleep to be honest <laughs> that was like pretty sick that was actually the reason for my insomnia uh, but yeah, uh, it just forced me to work more and more, and I'm very, very happy to actually had such a month uh, because it makes you aware that if you start getting lazy, you can easily get punished. But what's the most important thing is that my breakthrough point, or like month, we could say was April. And the reason, after thinking a little bit closely, is that I really understood what... Um, what Gordon wanted from me is this combination of like uh, understanding your opponent and and his tendencies. Uh, this was probably the breakthrough for for me at this point. So that was the whole challenge recap um, and a couple of words I could say. So um, that's about it. If somebody has any questions, feel free to ask already, or you can do it later, as you may wish. Um, so, and we move on to the next topic. What what I would do differently if I were to start all, all over again? Well, <laughs> to be honest, not much. I guess um, if I take a whole what happened to me the Sorry? Simple, pretty Sorry, me, around I think we have problems hearing you I don't know if uh, the internet connection got worse but I think you were cutting off a little bit like you said answer not much 
Um, okay. I'm not this sure. I, I personally cannot. Um, I don't see other people chatting. I don't know where they ask questions or not. Um, but I, yeah, I just wanted to let you know. But like, yeah, maybe you can continue. I'll mute myself. Uh, okay. Um, can you guys hear me? I hope yes. Uh, so I will continue. I will check here and there if you guys can hear me. So always, if somebody doesn't hear, please let me know. So as I said, I wouldn't change much. Um, I think um, there has to be some rough path along the way, uh, paths where you doubt in yourself, where you probably sometimes don't really see the end of the tunnel and the light that comes. But um, now looking back, I think... Uh, it's absolutely fine, but that doesn't mean I don't, I wouldn't change something or give something uh, tips to some of you guys who really think about doing the same. Um, basically, my first thing and one of the questions that I really got is speed or normal tables. Well, it's generally um, if you really want to start uh, this challenge like I did which anyone can really do, it's not like I'm genius uh, or God or whatever I'm really just a simple guy like everybody else, and I believe everybody can actually make it that far. Um, I generally tip that if you have like a bad mindset, if you really don't ha handle swings um, very good, then you probably are not really, you shouldn't be really going to play fast tables, zoom or whatever, simply because um, you're playing in a pool against other regulars, and so you cannot choose your seed or wherever, all these like small factors that can push up your win rates and so the win rates are smaller and the swings become come bigger. That's why I generally advise people if you really want to do this, I generally and are not really um, and you don't really get it, uh, very good along with the swings, you probably should choose normal tables and tables, so, I mean tables so like probably then I'll tune not but at um, if you play higher and 50, I would probably start uh, table selecting. Um, that's why I generally um, to tell people that they should be like looking for um, a, one good main poker room when they're playing like from L2 up to L50. That's something I did. I probably didn't do on the best side, but I still think uh, that was the right approach just to play like from NL2 to NL50 on, on, on one poker room. Um, one of the criteria, I would say, uh, is, in my opinion, a good rag to fish ratio and a solid rag break percentage. That's why I'm generally, um, for NL2 and NL50 player up to NL50 players, general pretty big fan of uh, sides like... Um, Micro gaming and PKR because they are not um, they they simply just give you even if you don't not um, even if you don't play that much you still get um, a flat rate back which is good and the fish to reg ratio is very decently overall um, that's generally my advice and or if you play like NL twenty five and NL fifty I'm generally find the Hive network pretty decently. Um, in general, what for me made, of course, the most money is um, after NL100, I started table selecting on multiple networks. Basically, um, I was really, really um, paying focus and attention on which tables I'm sitting. Um, I'm... I started lately to add a couple of regish tables where I think two, three uh, winner uh, losing regulars were at the table. But in the end, I always played on, on the table when least was one fish. That's why I'm playing on multiple networks because in one network it's really like hard um, to play. That's why I was like always looking for the best possible action that I can find on on as many as possible networks, and that's why I consistently added network as well to my stable. Um, one of the things I found for me to um, be really hard is that I don't think you should set yourself monetary goals, which like means I have to make this month. 10k um, because it can go both ways frequently um, 
I had, uh, for example, in August, um, I was told, let's see how much I would make, how much I will make from my coach, and I did make, and I did make it. Uh, but again, on, in September, I had myself challenged to go ahead and tr make this 30k mark, and in the end, finished just almost 10k, which is not bad. But you felt a little bit disappointed, and especially when it's going rough, it hits you more hard than if you kind of like detach yourself from, from these monetary goals. As well, I also had a volume goal in September, which I wanted to follow, and I have to say, uh, because of this goal, I, I lost at moments, I would say, definitely some money at the tables that could, could have I could have saved myself. So... Um, yeah, definitely. I I personally currently in a stage of actually making my goals rather like daily schedule, like um, grin this and this much, work on this game, work on your game, like th this much hour. That's like the way how I prefer to do things, and rather, um, rather uh, cut out this especially monetary goals. Volume goals I think are fine because they push yourself. Especially when it's going rough, it's more. Hello? Then if you, like, oh, yourself. Sorry, guys, I have like an echo. I don't know why. Volume goal in September, which I wanted to follow, and I have to say. Uh, okay, uh, sorry, it seems like everybody's going in, so I hear like an. Okay, echo seems like to be gone. So um, I, yeah. I took care of it. Um, it's when people join this, like, we had people only seeing through the stream right now, and I've sent them the link so that they, you know, can actually click, like, this blue icon on the top left. Um, ah, okay. I, 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 I will mute some people in case, otherwise you'll hear an echo, but don't don't worry, I'll take care of that. Just just keep talking, and if you want to answer questions or do whatever, um, you know, let me know. Okay. Um, so yeah, volume goals. I, on the other hand, I personally believe that vo volume goals are very good because they push yourself. You push yourself. Um, that's why I think uh, um, you have to sometimes just uh, find yourself in a spot where you you can't do it anymore, but you have to keep pushing. That's why, at least, what I experienced in general it brought me in general pretty good results. Um, the last thing is also something that I really um, get frequently asked is what kind of bankroll management I used or in general advice. Um, I heard like new new bankroll management coming up like with 10 buy-ins you can move up or something like that, extremely super aggressive. But in generally I used uh, 25 buy-in rule for NL, up to NL25. And I uh, would five find shot takes. Uh, and I don't fifty. Move your microphone, guys. Everybody, move their microphone, please. Thank you. Um, and then on fifty, I started um, with thirty buy-ins, and on one hundred with forty buy-ins, and on two hundred with fifty buy-ins. After that, um, I did not. Um, I did not follow. Any bankroll management, but rather um, how I actually beat uh, beat the games, because at that point um, it really doesn't matter if I if I would have forty buy-ins for you know, four hundred or like one hundred. It's more rather the case how am I doing on an all two hundred. So yeah. Uh, that's about it. This part, um, there's another part uh, which I think is for most of you going to be like um, more important or more interesting. It's the mindset part. My personal belief is more as I look at the poker world now and what me in this case made me successful is the mindset part. Um, I think the poker knowledge uh, whether to check call a flush draw is high. I think all this kind of lines you can see um, in general all the fancy play and all the straightforward you can find it on the internet. I mean there's so much already written about poker, how to increase your red line which is one of the things that I frequently get asked. That's that's everything written out there. But in, so in my opinion if you take like an L200 player he's probably like 
average in 100, but he's pretty skilled, actually. He's no pro a lot if you compare it to a couple of years ago. So I think what makes the difference in nowadays game is the simply the mindset. It becomes simply more and more important. And I think I'm definitely, through this coaching for profits that I made with Gordon, um, I definitely got... Uh, or I, I would say at least I got a pretty decent mindset. Um, so as I said, the mindset mindset is something that will more and more differentiate players. And one of the things that made me realize this is that we don't define ourselves on the good days, but rather on those really bad ones. There are simply in poker the days where you um, where you're simply gonna lose. This is just part of the game, and on that day, it's what what actually is making it a good day. If you lose less, then you should probably have to, um, and that's what I think matters. Especially if you like face the fifth cooler, and then you start calling to light or like going like a tilt, uh, which happens as well to I don't know for I don't know for hundred players. I think in the last session or something, I think there was generally a. Uh, an L400 player that I like really, really respect, and I think he's a pretty decent player. But he was on such tilt that I think he dropped I don't know five, six k, and just a couple of I think it was one hour, and then he quit. But it was like so sick how actually someone who probably technically is a pretty skilled player because of his mindset is just um um. Oh, sorry. Uh, where you finally got? And sorry, I just got a question from Lee Harrison that asked me what was my aha moment where you finally got it and understood it. Um, basically, as I said, it was like more um, in April when I hit the you know, 200 tables. I really, I really think it was that I really understood what my coach actually wants me to do or how I should generally act on the tables uh, it was more it was more like a feeling um, that you understand what your opponent is doing because um, as Gordon is probably not the master of GTO but is probably some a coach that understands through uh, and generally understands his opponent extremely well uh, so once I really understood how he uh, perceives players, for example, Hans, take a note if he does bet check bet line, uh, bet check bet bluffs, or like um, how does he react if he's capped, and so on, are just some of the small things that um, that matter, or like the snap bet. Um, when somebody snap bets on the river, um, some players I started to call and I was right. That was like um, sort of like eye opening how uh, how the psychological part of understanding of your your opponent can actually um, be pretty pretty helpful. Um, to come back to this mindset part, um, I believe that the determination, hard work, and what I think is frequently under undervalued is discipline is what brings you more money in today's games. Um, first of all, um, as we all progress and move and get better, um, simply hard work becomes part of your daily routine. And once you cut it out, you're going to easily be um, surpassed by others. While their determination, call it motivation or whatever you want it, I'd rather perceive something that can long term keep you willing to do the hard work. And the discipline is something that um, I think a lot of micro stakes players lack and is, a, my opinion, a pretty key part in poker. For example, if you say to yourself, I'm going to bet full the river, and then you should just do it. That's, that's, the, that's the plan, and being disciplined to, to go ahead with your plan and not have this emotional detachment, uh, attachment to your hand, and, oh, my opponent's bluffing, and so is, is frequently something 
that will be a more and more and more value skill and you know this game. That's why I'm thinking my players currently NL25 player uh, is probably he's not really stuck at micros because because I don't know he cannot hand basic can I cannot do basic hand he's probably be stuck at and the micros because of the mindset part. Of course NL20 NL25 NL25 NL50 players is has probably some leaks in, in his game. That's no doubt. I mean, I cannot say that if you're if you're playing micros that you don't have leaks. I mean, I on mistakes have leaks. But I think one of the most important thing is that, um, for especially the discipline, as in my opinion. That's why my advice for uh, micros is to create discipline, um, especially like on the river. Um, where people raise, I think on the micros it's like pretty, pretty easy most of the time to fold. Despite we have like the, I don't know, really strong hand, but I still think if you create discipline, which was one of my goals um, with the no six max bullshit, I'd still think in retrospect that was one of the goal of the coach. That's why I was able when I got higher, um, when I went higher, when I climbed the stakes, I got a little bit cally. And, but Gordon was able to point me out and say, okay, Hans, here is where you, you are allowed to call wider. Because normally you would fold. But he created in me uh, a discipline that was even sustainable, mostly even during some really tough periods. That's why my general advice is, is again, for my Chris player, if you are able to be disciplined and to stick to your plan, then, uh, then probably um, going out, uh, picking up on new knowledge and implementing it on your game is probably um, not going to be that hard. Um, and for low stakes players, I personally think, as I said, just the story with the NL400 player, um, you should probably just um, be able to cut out tilt and get rid of your negative emotions and especially learn to quit. Um, this is just like part of the game if you if you just simply uh, take a look how often did you find yourself a spot in a spot where you if you would have quit earlier you probably would have saved a ton of money. As I already told about this NL400 guy who I have like really big respect but when he tilts that and then he's going losing probably a really shit lot of money. So yeah, I really believe that mindset is going to be more and more important. So if you gonna work on that as well, and you're probably gonna have to, um, there's really uh, more ways to improve at this. Um, that's about the mindset part. I I also prepared um, the coaches. Uh, perspective, so I will give my word to Gordon. Okay. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, what's my perspective on the whole thing? Uh, first of all, if you have any questions, you can either uh, write it in the group chat or you can write it in the comments. Uh, for example, were uh, the person easy BPC has just uh, may uh, just given a question, um, so always ask me questions. I will uh, I will um, you know com combine them and you know if, if Hans gets some question, we'll interrupt each other and uh, that's no problem. So, but like quickly, what is it for a coach? Like, look, I'm basically starting with a guy. Um, well, I knew him from the forum, but I didn't uh, know a lot of things about him, and. Um, what I'm looking for, you have to understand, I didn't take on Hans because I'm such a nice guy or because um, Hans is such a nice guy. Um, I'm not a charity. We're like This is what people very often don't get, the difference between helping each other and helping and making money at the same time, like a win-win situation. So when I do coaching, I, I do this because I love it but that doesn't mean I want to uh, not get paid royally. Um, so yes, I'm looking for a good payment for some investment on my side that um, you know that I, I get a nice return on, blah, blah, blah. So I'm, I'm doing this in a professional way. And so I, what I look for most in people is character, um, discipline, 
and what Hans said about the Noble Shit 6 Max course, it, it's not the most brilliant work on poker. And uh, like I write like on the sales page, uh, actually, uh, of the course, it's like, you know, D David Sklansky would hate this book. And the poker world, you know, all those uh, advanced wannabe people on forums, like, they will hate it as well because it's against all their advanced shit. However, what is very important is stuff works. And by the way, I don't want to talk about the No Bullshit Six Max book. This is an AMA. This should not be like some bestpokercoaching.com advertisement. Um, just needed to quickly mention that. So I'll, I'll try. So please don't ask me, you know, how much the book costs or where you can get it. We really want to... Um, keep this advertising free. I think those people who really search, they will find it anyways. So AMA means ask me anything. So, okay, coach perspective. So first of all, if you have a student who makes 100K in nine months after starting at NL2, um, I'm lucky. So this is my upswing as a coach. I got the right person. Uh, what did I do right? What did I, did I do wrong? What can be done better? Well, my problem as a coach is that what I'm implementing into the student's mind is not what the student thinks he will learn. So, like Hans said in the beginning, got like even angry emails from him, like, fuck you, Gordon, that doesn't work. I thought we we're going to learn real poker. Like, uh, I mean, I should probably show those emails just for fun. And so my toughest time is to keep the student patient. Say, like, look, I've done this, been there, done that before, done it a million times with student. If you do exactly what I tell you to do, you will get the exact same so results of everybody else. So also when Hans said, it's like everybody can achieve that success, this is what he was saying. He was saying, if you do the things that Hans did, you will get the results that Hans gets. There's no super mega science behind this. However, how to get there? The toughest thing for me as a coach is always just students not listening. There's just one point where they will simply get it. This is what I call the matching point or the turning point. Like, for some people, it's like after two months, um, some people get it right away. Those are the miracles. They don't exist too often. Um, some people, like, need over a year because they just don't listen. I can tell you if somebody would ask me, what's the reason why you're not winning? It's simply because you're a stubborn idiot who does not listen to people who have done it. I could give you the advice out there. I could give you actually right now the exact blueprint, but I guarantee you most of you will simply not do it. And this is something that I still have to figure out as a coach. Why? I mean, I tell you, do not do this. Like, don't do this fancy play here. Don't make fancy plays. Do not balance on micro stakes. I even tell this people, people pay me 500 euro per hour for that, and then they still don't do it. Like, I don't get it. This is something I have to work on. However, the advantage with Hans was is that he was receptive. He was willing to listen. So that's one of the biggest skills. You know, it's kind of weird. You know, you're probably expecting like, oh, Hans is very good at calculating turn three bet ranges. And um, I don't know, he magically reads his opponents. Well, it's none of that. It's uh, the normal hard work and the discipline. Like also Hans, I don't have much to add because Hans said everything. In the tough moments, that's where you see a strength of a player. Like, as a coach, I'm always patient if people lose if they're on a downswing. Like, when Hans, like, ran pretty low EV and lost those 60 buy-ins at NL100, I was not worried at one moment. I'm never worried about this because I know if you do the right things in the long term, you will win. You have to, like, our theme of our side, champion, stand up one more time. You just have to stand up again. And most people give up, so I do not want to work with quitters. Hans was not a quitter. Even the worst times, we we're, of course, looking. Is there anything we can improve? And what we saw that didn't work out too well was playing too many speed tables. That doesn't mean speed poker is bad. It's just not suited for what we wanted at that specific time. Um, Hans is, of course, playing some speed poker as well. Um, I don't even know exactly the exact mix right now that he's playing. But, you know, at that time it wasn't good. So we changed that. We look what works. We do it. There's really not a lot more behind it. Um, however, there are, of course, always those secret things like how do you schedule your day, um, you know, which sites do you play on, at which time. Please do not ask me those questions. I will not answer them. And I'll tell you why. I don't want to be mean or anything. Uh, we give away a lot of knowledge for free. And in the future, you can probably expect more webinars like that. But 
listen, I'm a full-time professional on being professional, okay? <laughs> Which means Hans will be able to tell this, like, I want to know everything if he sends me, like, oh, Gordon, should I do this? That? I'm like, okay, do this, do this, do this, do this. I want a full report on that the next day. And then, you know, that's why Hans wrote rake reports. Like, I leave nothing up to chance. I'm not just like, oh, let's just sit there on the table and make it work. No, we pick tables. I tell them, pick table. Do this, this, this. If this and that happens, move the table. If uh, this or that happens, stay on the table, play more aggressive. We have this figured out to a science. Everybody can do that themselves, but, of course, this is years of hard work. However, if you follow simple advice, you can already get very far. Um, and you do not need any coach at all, in theory. What I also told Hans, like, you know, I was his coach. I'm proud of his achievement. But um, I'm sure he, he would have made the same without me. He would have just taken a lot longer. Maybe it would have taken two years, three years, four years. I don't know. Um, maybe forever. It, it's hard to say. just want to say, like, the work that you have to put in, you have to put in with or without a coach. But yes, as a coach, I can tell you it's always pleasant if your student goes above and beyond. And one thing that Hans did not share um, was this common myth of balance. Not I'm talking not about balance on the poker table, but I'm talking about balance in life. You hear a lot of shit people talking these days about, oh, find your zen, find your inner shit. As far as I know, zen has never paid a bill. As long as I know, as far as I know, Sen has never moved you up to NL1K. There's always a place for everything in life, and if you have worked really hard for some years, there's definitely a lot of value in relaxing, going on Sen, and, you know, do all that stuff. Um, that's all good. But there is no balance. Look, if you're a micro stakes player right now and you want to move up, like if you want to move up fast like Hans, you know, in one year, fuck your social life. You know, you're not going to go out a lot. That's just the truth. Um, Hans will tell you that. You know, he went definitely out a lot more before. And oh, yeah. if you're simply not willing to do some sacrifices, this is not for you. This is the hard truth. Like, I could tell you, like, oh, everybody make it, blah, blah, blah. You have to do some sacrifices. And those people who are bullshitting, like, but yeah, I need to take care of other parts of my life. Ask them how much money they have. They're fucking broke donkeys. Nobody, I guarantee you, nobody who has made it far at anything, but especially at poker. All of us had one part of our life where we were not very social people. That's just the truth. I know in my first year of poker, um, I went out, I think, like three times in the whole year. Yeah. And, you know, once I made it, I, I said, like, okay, now I can afford that luxury of going out. Now I value that as something. But... Like, we don't lie to people. Um, if you want to look for some, you know, get-rich-quick advice, like, without doing anything, you're probably going to get scammed. You have to work hard. What Hans said about discipline, play those eight hours, six times a week, minimum. Play them. Don't listen to all those idiots saying, like, play two to three hours a day. What the fuck is this shit? I mean, what do that guys think? Always, if you listen to somebody... Always look, where is their money? Do not listen to anybody who has not made a shit ton of money at this game. They have no clue. They just talk bullshit that they read in some random book that they think is good. Only look to people who have made it. It's not popular to say this. And, um, you know, I'm a big friend, by the way, of, you know, spiritual... I, I don't know, spiritual is the wrong word. But, like, you know, I'm a philosopher. Deep, deep, deep downside. Yes, I like to take long walks. I take to. I like to take time off. Oh, once I made a lot of money, I actually took months off. You know, wander in nature, do that stuff, go out a lot. You know, I love that stuff. Don't get me wrong. I'm a guy who actually does it. But you know, telling somebody who's playing NL20 that they need a life balance and that's so that's so sad. You know, I mean, not everybody has to become a professional. Um, and it's perfectly fine to have this as a hobby. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't, for fuck's sake, fool yourself and listen to those idiots who are broke, by the way. You know? It's like this thing, like, most life coaches 
or something like that. They're broke as hell. I mean, what do you want to learn from them? Like how to be lazy, do nothing? Like seriously. I mean, it tilts me every time I see that. And again, there's always good exceptions and people have different goals in life and I respect that, but I'm here for people who want to crush at this game. So if you want to crush at this game and if a student writes me an email and says like, listen, Gordon, um, you know, uh, I, I would love if you can coach me and everything, but, you know, you know, but I can only play three hours a day. How can we do this? Like, actually, seriously, like, this is like an insult. There's an insult to me when somebody writes like that. Like, hey, I want everything from you, but I'm not willing to do anything myself. Fuck you. Fuck you and your ass. I, I hope Google will not ban this, but like, yeah. So let me answer some questions. This is my coach's uh, perspective. Um, so yeah, I will go step by step. And if there's a, hand, uh, a question for Hans, um, yeah, they, maybe we both answer. I mean, if it's only for Hans, obviously Hans answers. Which side was, in your opinion, the most profitable during the challenge? Um, like again, um, Hans already gave some comments on sites, but this is like figure it out on your own. You know, I mean, uh, that's easy BPC. Um, like, well, I mean, even if I told you it's uh, iPoker, play on iPoker. Well, what are you gonna do? Like probably most of you aren't gonna even sign up on iPoker, but like most of some of you will sign up on iPoker and say like, oh, I'm running bad, must be wrong. Um, this advice is not helpful. What's helpful is if I told you um, iPoker between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. European time. Now, like I said, we figure this shit out, but I mean, I don't feel comfortable giving away that stuff for free. But I'm just saying, like, you can do that yourself. Um, and there is not. I mean, every site has their pros and cons. I can tell you that. Uh, whether it's security, rake back, bonus, data mining, not data mining, uh, there's all of this out there. So this is something you have to figure out on your own, but it's not that complicated. I mean, in the end, if you work hard, it doesn't matter that much which side you play. Sure, playing on the right side gives you a big advantage, but you can make it either way. Um, Hans, just interrupt me if you have stuff to add, OK? Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, Prog, do you see the comment of uh, one, two, three, feeling good? In this yeah, case? I did see. He's asking me what was my working adding, and in other words, how uh, uh, how did I learn, and what was my playing to studying ratio, how many hours a month were I dedicating to poker? So mm -hmm. I guess that's multiple question, and uh, actually one question. So I'll probably start piece uh, part by part. Um, what was my working adding? Um, basically, my working adding was mostly um, fo um, was increasing or like decreasing based on my results. So when we were going through rough phases, I was doing more, uh, more I don't know equity calculations. Um, and uh, generally flopzilla spending more time how does my hand flops uh, even created like a playability chart um, and so on so I would say my at my best days uh, when I was really running like shit or like the last month where I work a little bit more as you for those of you who have followed my red line as well decreased my blue line went ahead um, I would say uh, when I'm running bad, it's mostly like 60-40 and goes in favor always of um, grinding. Uh, I, I'm always probably grinding more than actually working off tables. Um, so, yeah. And when I'm doing good, like, for example, August or, like, July, I was, like, I guess 80% uh, grinding and 20% uh, doing off table. I'm generally think that if things work the way um, they work and they seem to showing result, um, I don't think there's really uh, a lot you should be too much working. You have to check um, general like hands, reviewing them, going over, having coaching and so on, but it's not like I did spend mostly okay um, I have here top pair and now I'm thinking this top pair goes into my checking behind range, this top pair goes into my betting half pot on this texture, and so on in general, all these small things that you kind of, um, all these small details that make a thought process even higher, so, yeah. Um, I can add something. Um, 
one thing that I generally suggest is that uh, most people either think they have to study too much, and those people who want to study too much, those are actually scared shit of playing. Those are the type of people who play like two to three hours a day. Um, I call them lazy. They're not always lazy. They're sometimes also scared to just get shit done. Um, those are those people. And then there are the people who are the mindless people who just sit down. They just sit on random tables. They just open them and they just play like a stoner. They don't even think much. Um, they just play, 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 click buttons, and at the end of the day, hopefully not losing too much. Um, so those are the two extremes. Um, we have to find the right mixture. I, I'm the first to say I did not study a shit ton while I was playing myself. And the reason is because I was always actively playing. Um, I have an analogy. Some of you guys, or maybe all of you, probably went to school at some point in your life, and there was like a way where you could, uh, if you paid a lot of attention in school, if you listened a lot to the teacher, which I never did, but like you could have done that, right? Um, you did not have to do a lot of homework, or you did not have to do a lot of studies before the next school day, because you already paid attention, you used that time effectively. So this is what I did at the poker table. I always thought actively, like, what could he do? I was always guessing, always guessing, what does my opponent have? I, you can ask all of my students, like, they will tell you, like, I'm always guessing hands in coaching. Like, for me, it's fun, and for me, it's a game. Like, Hans is already laughing, you know? I already, I, it's for me always fun to put people on hands and to be right most of the time. I mean, it's, it, it gives me, it's, it's just so good for your ego, you know? If you're not, you know, if you're not playing full-time anymore, and you still sit down and beat the shit out of everybody. I mean, this feels so great, I can tell you. Um, and <laughs> the funny part is that actually guessing the hand is way harder <laughs> with a fish than with a regular. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Because with a regular, you can at least use some type of logic, you know, you can narrow down its ranges. But what are you going to do with, like, a 50 BCIP fish, you know? <laughs> You know, you have this, is it like Ace King or Jack for Offs? Like, <laughs> never know. But so it gets even harder. But like, yeah, that's what I can say. So, in a way, um, what I recommend most people is to have like a solid, uh, solid. Um, how to say? Like, I, I forgot the word in English. Uh, like a solid routine, like a low-level routine, which is like. Uh, for some of our coaching for profit students, that is, for example, posting at least three hands per day in the forum, answering other people's hands, which means like they're at least actively thinking about something. So even if I didn't give them a lot of homework, they're not just gonna do nothing. Um, own motivation is always important. Like do a lot when you're at the table. Pay attention to everything. Make it a fun game. You know, for me, it was always fun. Like like I said, like I'm getting. I'm getting brain orgasms when I guess the hand of uh, of a person, of a poker player. And then I saw people who are just, I have students, who are just playing. They win a hand, like actually with a crazy hand that they should never win. And they don't even bother looking at the hand, what the opponent had. They don't even care. Like that's what drives me crazy. Hans, you were in the beginning like that, I remember. Like you didn't always look <laughs> for the hand. Like that. That drives me crazy. Like I'm sitting there and like I cannot like I cannot imagine like why does he doesn't want to know? Like does does he not care? So this is what drives me crazy, like carelessness. People just not giving a fuck. That drives me crazy. So if you're ever having coaching with me, now you know how to put me on tilt. Um, but yeah, so studying, uh, when it's going worse, you have the natural, you know, follow the night nature flow, make sure you always study some, but when it goes worse, study a bit more. Uh, when it goes really well, when you're in that playing flow, uh, take it as long as it lasts, and every good run will come to a, to a stop. Hans experienced that last month with his downswing. Um, he worked, got his shit together again, is winning again, had a good month. That's how it works. So always make sure that when you get a sign from nature or from variance or from ever who it is, if things don't go well, take action. Um, let me see. Speed or normal tables? We answered that. Dragon College. Not sure it's the right word, but you still take students for coaching for profits. Uh, yes, we take students for coaching for profits. Um, go on bestpokercoaching.com, uh, FAQ, and look coaching for profits. You find a link there. Uh, we still take people, but of course there's a waiting line right now. But the sooner you get in, the better for you. 
uh, just because we already have enough people and I, we have to make sure that we're treating everybody good otherwise it makes no sense so we cannot take too many people good next question no BS is a good general guideline I suppose um, the question of Dean Banco from the stream I find that I'm losing money with them playing straight no BS so um, yeah Dean um, when you say you feel like losing money um, I, I remember you um, from sending emails by the way to everybody Dean has done like a brilliant chart for the No Bullshit Six Max book thanks a lot for that it's in the attachments um, but yeah uh, I know Dean that you're not playing a high volume so when you're losing after 30k hands that doesn't mean too much I mean variance can be crazy like I also we had like a guy at uh, NL50 he was winning I think like at 12 big blinds per hundred playing zoom at NL50 and he credited all to the No Bullshit Six Max book of course I'm not gonna say no that wasn't me <laughs> yeah sure I want to take credit but I mean <laughs> Let, let's be honest. Like that's obviously not a sustainable win rate, and I'm sure I'm sure the guy played very well, but yeah, there was probably some type of run good involved. So you have those two extremes. Um, whether something is working or not is actually really hard to find out without like you posting hands and playing well. Um, so yeah, when you play against fish, of course. Some things change, but this is where you have to start to adapt. What I'm saying is the no bullshit, it's just a no bullshit idiot proof guide. If you follow that, you will not get into deep trouble. Like it's I, I don't want to say it's probably impossible to lose at micro stakes if you follow that. However, you always have to combine it with posting hands. I mean everybody of you who's watching, um, this is not a best pokercoaching.com commercial. You have your own forums whatever that is, wherever you're coming from, feel free to post there. You can post on our forums as well, of course, but again, I said it's not about BPC today. It's about, um, you know, Hans AMA and you improving. So um, post three hands each day. Comment on five other hands. Do that every single day. That's a habit. This is what makes you strong in the long term. It's not like some magic bullet of wisdom that you get part of it yeah but like if you just do those simple things every single day do that for a year I guarantee you I've not seen one person I've not seen one person not beating the games if they do that that's why all of my students who are in the coaching for profits closer with me yeah we got now a lot more people but like that's why everybody made 10k after some point per month everybody there's no exception because we do simple things, but we always do them. That's the secret to Hans' success. Like, Hans, tell me what you think about those advanced uh, guys that you sometimes watch on video. Do you think they're, they're <laughs> worse than you? I mean, they're, they're, they're making a lot less money than Hans, but Hans, what do you the, think about The that? funny part, guys, was like I had um, a 29K month, and I was looking at one of the coach that from... A German community, it's a really awesome coach. I structured my head based on his, and in general, a coach that I really, really love. And I saw in his his blog, he's making less money than him, than me. But I was like, how is that possible? I mean, what am what is he not doing? Is he's playing even higher than me? So, um, I just simply did did not get it. But in the end, I realized um, what I'm actually making better. He's probably a better poker theoretician than myself. Um, but as I said, I made more money. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, that's what I want to say. We teach, or Hans learned. Put it that way. I don't, like again, you know, I'm automatically in the like we from BPC type. Like I have to try to turn that off. Like sorry if I can't. It's just like I'm just so passionate about it. But um, yes, like Hans learned how to make money. There's a difference between trying to be a good poker theoretician or how to make money at this game. Two very different things. Um, that's just the main point. And most people don't know how to make money. They don't know how to make money in real life. They think the skill, I mean, 
the skills that they learn are not what bring them money. That's why, like most university degrees, are not even worth the paper. Uh, I mean, they're written on. Why? Like, why do you think you study like I don't know four to eight years? I mean, listen, you're studying four to eight years. Then you come out of school. Let's say a country like Germany, you start like earning like one to two k euros per month. And if you're in another country like Croatia, Hans even told me like whatever, 200 to 250 euro per month, right? I don't know. No, in uh, neighbor countries, yeah. I'm I'm sorry, like yeah, but make it 400, 500 euro. I mean, seriously, stunning four to eight years and then make that? Like what the fuck? Like something has to be wrong. But like people are so fucked up in their mind that they don't realize that. And you know, there there's one guy like Hans who's just studying a lot for one year and, you know, he's just making 100K. Like, maybe more than the prime minister of his country or something. <laughs> Probably he'll make more next year than that. So, why? It's because he's learning the right things. Sure, not everybody will learn poker, but it's actually in business, it's the same thing. The skills that you need to make money are often very different from those people who you think are smart in school. So, let's go on. Quentin Zilber asked, I think you're putting everything in the same basket when it comes to spirituality. I think meditation, for example, can teach you how to control tilt a lot. And you're totally right, Quentin. Um, I hope uh, there was no misunderstanding. Um, I'm just making a little bit fun of people who are, who are like life coaches, um, who are trying to teach you improve life and poker game. When they, ha when they don't know shit about poker, they're like mediocre players at best, and they want to teach you how to make more money. It's like, what the fuck? It's a joke. Um, if you want to learn how to be lazy and do nothing, sure. I don't know why you should pay anybody to do that, but yeah, sure. Um, I, I recommend, by the way, meditation. I think it can be a very helpful tool for a lot of people. Um, I even recommend that like, as a pre-session warm-up to all my coaching for profit students. So don't get me wrong. I think there's a lot of good stuff there. A lot of good stuff. Just make sure you're not falling into this like feely, oh balance and all of that shit. Like, uh, I would like to reply to Thomas Melek, who um, actually the, his first question was, "What would you advise me to look for in a coach?" Um, this is generally a pretty hard question, but I guess you pretty much pointed pointed it out, and depends what also what you're looking for um, for example um, definitely previous student experiences well if you had like successful students in terms of like buying people buying hours from him uh, it doesn't mean that he's actually able to necessarily um, turn and be extremely successful uh, in the coaching for profits program that's in my opinion like two very different drinks. Of course, it's definitely a plus from his side, but it's very good. Probably, personally, I would, pr I wouldn't probably be um, working here with Gordon if I wouldn't see actually Stephen making um, making success because. I'm a champion for all who don't know his real name. Yeah, Stephen, aka, aka I'm a champion. Um, he was. He simply showed that the guy really knows um, how to basically structure your whole uh, learning progress and steadily increase uh, your income, move up in stakes and so on. That's like, um, and it was obvious that the student does really get what he's trying to point out and then he uh, exercised that on me and yeah. So yeah, definitely, um, it, it again, depends on what you're looking for. Maybe Gordon will probably add something more. The second question, is it common to have something like 33 minutes discussion with a coach before sealing the deal? Oh, well, yeah, definitely 30 minutes, if not more. Uh, I think Gordon devoted me a lot of time, to have to be fair and honest, so it was more than 30 minutes, I can say. Um, but yeah, uh, it's definitely common to spend something like at least 30 minutes, I would say. Uh, what do you... <laughs> Okay, okay, I totally disagree, but I totally disagree. But I'll I'll let you know in a second why. I think there are two. What do you consider to be a standard uh, hourly rate for NL50 on a 100 coach in these days? Well, I guess if the coach is coaching for NL50 and on 100, I mean he's at least being a big winner on 100. 
and I guess a pretty decent on L200. Um, that's at least the, the spectrum where I'd be looking for for a coach that he's playing this, which means that his hourly should be probably around, uh, I guess, 70 $80 per hour, something like that, I guess. Uh, and that should generally mean that he would also coach for these amount of hours. I'm not like 100% sure it's like extremely dependent, but if I remember, I was making already in 50. I was making like thirty dollars. So I would say a big crusher on one hundred and two hundred has definitely like a seventy eighty dollar hour uh, hourly on the stakes after rake back, of course. Anyway, to you, Gordon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So number one, I, I'm answering this um, the question from Thomas Medlik again. Uh, what should you look for a coach? Uh, it's very simple. Um, you should actually not even care if he was a good player at all. It obviously helps, but you should. The most important and the only thing you should be looking for has this coach helped somebody exactly like you to become somebody like you want to become. Everything else is not important. I mean, let's just say, for the sake of it, I happen to have played high stakes. I happen to have crushed, and that's all cool and good, but. In the end, um, there are other high stakes players in the world, um, and probably Ezil is not a very great coach. I just assume that obviously genius player. But so you should really look: has the coach done exactly what you're looking for? That's like the, the most simple solution. Just look: has this coach in the past ha helped a player who was as good as that as I am in the similar situation? Blah 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 to achieve those things. That's the only thing you should be looking for, and then you shouldn't care. Like, you know, whether maybe, maybe there's this magic coach. I haven't met him, but like he plays NL10, but helps people move up from NL100 to 200. If he re repeatedly does that, you shouldn't care if he plays NL10. Like, if he's good, he's good. Like, you, you should be looking for results, not for like, I don't know, um, not for like cosmetics. Like, oh, uh, does this guy have like a nice red line? I happen to have the nice red line, but I, I never want to advertise with it because it's not important. For me, it's an accident that I had the red line. It's like really an accident. Like I didn't care for it. It just happened to be that that was the most profitable way to do things. That's all. So <laughs> next, number two, is it common to have a 30-minute free discussion with the coach before sealing a deal? Uh, what Hans, Hans didn't tell you, he might have misunderstood it, but we're talking about coaching for profits where, where I spend more time with Hans. Uh, Hans never bought one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching with me as far as I know. Um, so... The coaching for profits deal, I mean, you can imagine it's a huge deal. And trust me, I do not spend one minute with anybody who I don't feel is at least a great prospect and has a great history. So the reason why I spent time with Hans is because he was the most active member on the forum. He has already, uh, he had Bob-like uh, courses. So I knew this guy is not just some guy who wants to talk with me and have a nice chat about the world. That's the only reason why I talk with Hans. Um, there are coaches who give you free 30 minutes, but listen, um, I know this sounds not very nice and politically correct, but a coach who has some value will, sorry, not waste your, his time with you. This doesn't sound nice, I know. But look, you're from, from the perspective of the coach, you're like one of hundreds of random people, and... Um, you know, maybe you'll just talk 30 minutes um, and then go away, you know? And then the coach lost 30 minutes. If the coach is, has any self-respect, if he has, like, an hourly of, like, you know, 200 plus at least, he's giving you $100. Why? Think about it that way, yeah? So the way I do it, I have an assistant. Um, she takes care of all of that stuff. Once somebody shows me they're putting money on the table, then I will also open up. Yeah. Why? It's not only because I go, oh, I'm only looking for money. No, I respect the people who will give. And the people who give, they get a lot more back uh, than they pay. But there's a lot of people out there who just want to talk a little bit, have some questions. Um, how did I learn that? How do I know? I've done it myself. When I started this in the beginning, of course I was willing to talk more because nobody knew me. Some people uh, said that I was a scammer, like there was yesterday guy in the 2 plus 2 thread. He said, like, oh, shit, like, I 
Pop, back then that you're some scammer, blah, blah, blah. You know, should happen. So back then I had to prove myself. So I was willing to talk more. But like, I remember people, that's why I don't answer anything on Skype. People who wanted to have a chat with me on Skype, they never bought anything. And listen, I'm not here to talk with people. I'm not a charity. Um, I love helping people who want to be helped. And Hans will tell you, we had like coaching sessions for three hours inside. We had that like more than once. Why? Because I generally enjoy it once somebody is committing. I want to give my time to the people who deserve it, who are willing to work hard. Um, and if you're showing that, anybody of you watching, listening, whatever coach you're going to work with, I personally would never talk to somebody who will give me 30 minutes of this time for free. Why? Well, listen, like, if, if this guy has 30 minutes to give away, I mean, you really think he's going to be a great coach? I don't, don't know. He's probably going to be a very nice person. He's probably be some, like, a good friend and always talk on Skype, too. Um, but he's not going to be good at making money. Somebody who's good at making money does not give 30 minutes for free to just anybody out there. Sorry, that's not very nice to say. Um, I hope this video never gets published. I guess it will. Um, <laughs> such an egotistical asshole. Life. Well, no, I'm just telling you the truth of every person who has value to offer. So again, when I talked to Hans, I thought it was a very well-invested time. I mean, I like the guy a lot just because, um, you know, I mean, talking from back then, uh, like, he was the most active member of the community. Of course, like, of course I'm going to take my time. Like, how could I not, you know? So, yeah. What is the standard hourly? Question number three, what's the standard hourly for N100, uh, N50, N100? Um, I have a very different opinion on coaches and coaching. Um, I'm very skeptical of most coaches, let me tell you the truth. And I don't even view them. They're, I have no competition. I really have no competition. I, I don't... You can trust me with that because I do not have coaching to sell to you right now. Like, if you ask me if you can have coaching, there's no time for me to do that. So don't think I'm saying this, oh, blah, 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 because, you know, I want to, I think they're competing. No. Why? Look at the people who have really helped students. Every coach can get some friend to make a nice review. There are very few coaches who really give change to people. That's all I'm going to say. Look, why are not more people doing that, taking on students from zero to hero? Why? Because it's fucking hard if you're not a good coach. So often if you get like an NL100 player as a coach, without a clear structure, it can be a waste of money, actually. So it always has to be, I would say, approved. And yes, this is my personal thing right now. I'm, I'm building a system, but like um, you have to make sure that that NL100 player at least has a clear structure, that maybe that NL100 player has been coached by a player who's a lot higher, so he can pass down good knowledge, even if he can't implement it himself. Yeah, It's like, let's say I'm coaching an NL10 guy right now. I'm teaching him all this stuff. Sure, that NL10 guy could be a good coach for an NL2 player. Yeah, But there are a lot of like semi-successful NL100 players. Yeah, poker is still too easy to be true. People with mediocre talent can get very, very far. Um, they can just like not be stupid and get far, but they will suck as a coach. So, yeah, that's my honest, non-correct, uh, non-politically correct opinion on there. Uh, let's go through more questions. Uh, thanks, Gordon. Um, which signs are most important when you table select with small player data? Which signs? Well, obviously VPIP. I would say, like, if you have a guy, if you have a guy who has a 60 VPIP on a six max table, you know you're on a winner table. Um, yeah, that's all I can say. Other than that, look for people doing completely stupid things. I don't know, bluffing with complete air on the turn, something. I mean, completely stupid things. Um, what's your daily routine, Hans? Um, well, I can answer that. Play poker, play poker, play poker, sleep, play poker. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, but like maybe Hans can answer. 
Well, um, I don't really have like a very structured routine. I have like my rather goals that I have to accomplish, and based on my uh, daily schedule with kind of keeping up with friends, whatever doing, uh, I create mostly my schedule. I also know the times when I get the best action. So yeah, based on that, I mostly structure my day. It's mostly like a day-to-day -day, uh, structure. It's not like, and sometimes I have to be honest and say sometimes it's dependent on the traffic, my structure. It's not like I'm just going to sit down and playing uh, because now it's my playing time uh, and the traffic is extremely bad. I just simply postpone it and do another, another part of the day where I think I will get better action. Or like on one day I play more, on the next day I have more free time. There is like uh, some meet up with friends and so on. So I generally like, um, as I said, mostly create my structure uh, on based on my uh, real life obligation. Let's call them like that. That okay. I generally use the I'm generally using the flexibility that poker is allowing me. Okay, I have to say something because this sounds most. I mean, if you listen to Hans. This sounds like he's playing four hours a day, but you, know, I mean, everybody knows that it's the opposite. Um, there's people who need a lot of structure, and there's a people who do not need it at all. Uh, with Hans, I knew he never needs that. That's why I never pushed any schedule on him at all. Why? Because he was playing always more than needed. Like if he played a bit less, I would have never said anything. You know, uh, like never. So some people get along with that very well. Others not. Now, if I probably ask here, are you more the organized, do you need more an organized schedule, or uh, are you more like a free flow guy? Most people might say, like, oh, free flow guy. The truth, however, is most of the free flow guys are fucking lazy, and in the end, they don't get things done. So, in the end, people are different. Like, I'm also more of a free flow guy, um, but I give myself structure when I see that I'm becoming lazy. Or, or when I have hard things, uh, when I have a hard time organizing stuff. Um, so everybody should just keep that in mind. Uh, if you get your, if you get the objectives done, you're doing it fine, no matter how you get it done. Uh, however, if you're unable to get simple things done, like in the coaching for profits group, we have we had a couple of people who were like, oh, schedule is so hard, blah, blah, blah. like. I gave them a simple calculation, showing them that they had like I think like eight free hours every day plus one free day, like reasonably. So they're wasting time, they're doing some shit, they're doing something wrong. And those type of people, they need more structure. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's just like different people have different needs. Um, different people get to success differently. Um, how do you go about implementing certain theory concepts that you got from coaching or from other sources? Do you have a poker diary, give yourself assignments, concrete examples? I guess that's for you, Hans. Mm, okay. Um, I guess there were even questions below, so probably I do listen to music while playing or just strictly paying attention. Um, generally, I'm only listening to music when I'm playing below my regular stakes, which means NL100 mostly. Uh, when I'm just playing NL100 and I'm like tuning up and there's no action, I'm like tuning up a little bit of music, so yeah. Uh, what is the difference in limits? Fish play same, regs are a lot better when you move up. Um, yeah, as far as higher as you go, people make less mistakes. That's simply that's what, how they actually came uh, that high. People, I would say they mostly do play the same. They get a little bit, um, I wouldn't say tighter, but they are a little bit more inclined to fold um, because the effect of money, but in the end, fish is a fish and they still make a ton of mistakes. But the difference between like an NL200 and 400 or like up compared to an NL50 player, as, as I said, um, they make less mistakes either mostly post flop, uh, pre flop. I don't uh, I don't think that's very important. Uh, what was me who called myself? Um, how do you go about implementing certain theory concepts that you get from coaching or from any other shows? Do you have a poker diary? Um, for example, I personally um, hardly do theory concepts implement. I mean, I started doing some, especially like um, 
defining um, my preflop ranging, categorizing, for example, where does ace-jack plays off if I get a four bet, or what um, what what generally goes into my four bet range. Generally, like um, structure all this so I can get um, so I can get more disciplined uh, and faster playability when I multi-table. Uh, what do you think is the most appropriate tribute to play on this day's micro small stack? That's like hard to say. I guess something like uh, along 20, um, I don't know, 25, 22, three bet of seven, eight, something like that. I guess, is my guess. I don't know. Is it Eventually, important? Um, I guess it's not really that important. No, very but good. That, okay. That's my that's my guess. I don't think it's really important. You, you should tell that yeah. people like yeah because like. The many questions that we get are not, if you want to improve, you have to look what makes the difference. And what you, okay, this is also a hard thing that I can say as a coach. Um, what the student thinks should be changed or is important is usually not what is important. And why? The reason is very simple. You think the way you think. And whatever you have done or whatever you are thinking right now, it, the result is where you are right now. So the way you are thinking or the way you have thought the last year has brought you the results that you have right now. So if you want to have different results and different things, guess what? You have to think differently. Because if you do the same things again, yes, you will get the same results. It's like a famous quote that everybody's using now these days. If you try, I think, definition of an idiot is like trying the same things, expecting different results. Yeah. So if you think, oh, if I just got my three bet stats right, then I'm going to succeed. This is probably the last thing you need to do. And it's okay that you ask the question. I'm just telling you, like, this is sort of the, the hard thing about coaching because I cannot convince you of something that you do not believe in the first place. So I probably have to give you some, that's in the coaching, like I shouldn't say this, but I probably have to give you some bullshit answer on the, on the three-bet part first before you listen to me at all. Uh, that's some coaching psychology. Uh, because if I don't tell you that, you will never believe me. So I had the same issue a little bit with Hans in the beginning. It's normal. Like I, I'm like that. Everybody's like that. Um, I'm just saying, like, look, you should, if, if you want to be really fast succeeding, Ask what really makes the difference. And Hans said that, like, he's talking about mindset, discipline, doing regularly things, no bullshit approach. But yeah. Um, okay, you mentioned post flop Zilla. Can you explore? Well, I simply just was looking how often the flop top pair strong draws. This is mostly like compared, especially to uh, four bet pots, which calling out of position and so on, or in general in position. Uh, do you play heads up? Yeah, I do play heads up from time to time. Um, I think it's really. Uh, generally is a good experience for yourself. You get more comfortable, especially in the 3-bet pots, since you play them more. Uh, also, ranges are wider. Um, generally, yeah, I just love as well heads up, and from time to time, I do play them myself. Um, uh, what tools and when to take in use? Um, Flopzilla, I think Flopzilla probably around in 10 and 25. Had extensions, um, start playing higher low stakes like you know 100 I think you know 50 can also be sometimes helpful and then as you go higher I guess probably you know 100 plus uh, card runner CV becomes I guess more and more important uh, probably somewhere if you're playing like you know, 200 zoom it's also at first uh, I know this is a pretty specific question but do you think a main journal well this starts already from understanding which range crushes the other range or like uh, all, all down to bet sizing. I mean under bets, over bets. Uh, in general I think there's way too many factors just to reply that. Do you use Krev? Yeah, I do sorry, use sorry. but I'm not, an, I'm not an expert. Uh, you want to I'm, say something? Or? Yep, yep. Uh, just one quick thing. Um, Flopzilla, Cardrunner ZV and all those uh, hot extensions there's like some really awesome shit out there. What I always say is we're good despite basically not using them. Like in my coaching with Hans, we have not used any advanced HUD. Like nothing. Like we haven't excessive use of Flopzilla or Cardrunner's Review. Um, 
I'm saying we're good despite that, not because we didn't use it. Um, make sure like you keep the focus on the right things, but however, I told Hans as well, if you want to improve further now, you really got to use those tools. So they are important. Uh, but, you know, there are many things you can improve on. Okay. Um, do you use Kravia? As I said, I do use, and I don't think it's very useful, a low limit. Um, maybe I would start probably start using it at L200. I think it gets things more important uh, since you're making more and more and more people are aggressive and you make more and more 10 plays. How many play, many tables should I play and what is the best way to rid off Omaha nuts tanking? Um, well, the second part is not really understand generally how many tables. That's like hard, I guess. If you, it's never wrong to start with less and to improve to more. Um, so, so I guess I would start with four and and see where it goes. Uh, um, my thoughts about grinding sit and goes. Well, um, my thoughts is simply that it's not bad if you're more like. I think they're probably like a mechanical way of playing poker um, with like shoving ranges and so on. I think there is probably some room for it, but as a cash game is simply the creme de la creme uh, of poker, I guess. Um, and it's the biggest skill of all cash game. At least that's like my opinion. So it uh, depends what you're looking for. The biggest long term value, in my opinion. Yeah, and might as well, but we are... Make money at everything you do, and... Yeah, I'm not going to say sit and goes are bad. Like, nothing is bad or good. Omaha is not bad or good. It's it's a different game that requires different skills. Um, I always see, like, um, like, a good cash game player will have close to no problem entering a sit and go, but, like, I talk to successful sit and go players all the time, and, uh, you know... They're they're like they're like NL two players like they just have no clue at like they have n no clue at all literally it's just like too different for them um, yeah okay Maybe, uh, last question from Tobias um, Hans do you want to talk about that uh, I guess I don't I'm currently working on some diets um, so I do watch a bit I don't meditate at all. Uh, and I generally don't have any more a cool down or a warm up routine anymore. I had a prior to that, but with time, um, I simply just was able to achieve my best without that. So, um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, like I said, like I, I recommend this to everybody to do it. But if you like, if you find your way without it, don't do it. Like I never in my life uh, made a a warm up or cool down like my type of warm up was just you know uh you know whatever be clean like you know take a nice shower before um you know have having eaten like a little bit about diet um a lot of players let me put it that way you can eat the worst food in the world and you can be a brilliant poker player um like you know people who come up with all this like diet meditate find yourself schedule yourself um this is like it's like very important if you have other leaks yeah if you have discipline leaks this is like so important if you have tilt leaks having like if you have strong tilt issues doing like this cool up and warm down is so important however it's not essential but it is it is a it is an area that can give you an edge and the the, the the smaller the edges get, the more you have to look out for stuff like, you know, nutrition, eating right. Um, but like, you know, don't like don't fall into the trap that believing like, oh, if I only ate correctly, I would play better. Probably there's eating healthy and having a healthy body, exercising, like it can never hurt and it's always good for you. Um, Yes, and it always has a good effect. So I suggest that to everybody. Like, but I, I don't like like this over exaggeration of people. Like, oh, you know, I kind of suck at this game. But if I only exercise, everything is good. No, I, I, I totally disagree with that. Um, yeah, about food. Like, um, yeah, everybody, everybody should find their way. Like, try out. There, there are several diets um, that you could check out. I'm into that, but like I don't feel ready right now to push 
push my view onto others yet. So I, I mean, I'm actively testing out right now stuff as well. But yeah. Okay, guys. I guess that's pretty much it. It if you um, don't have to mention anything. Do you have anything more, Gordon? Yep, Hans. Who do you think is the best poker player of all times? Give me one name. It starts with G and uh, ends with Ordon. Okay, it was lame. You didn't get it. It's okay. <laughs> Don't worry. No, I was kidding. No, no. Uh, oh, who, who do you think was the best poker player in the world of all time? You? Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. no, no, but like real opinion, like. Uh, my real uh, opinion. Just uh, fun, I mean, who do you like? I personally uh, love uh, Ike, but I think the best player is probably, I think, pretty easily Phil Ivy in my eyes. But I personally prefer probably a little bit more um, Ike. Okay, okay. Good, good. Uh, Hans, do you have the last word? No, I would just like to say thanks to you and all of you guys for participating. Uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to email me. Um, besides that, thanks for watching and good luck at the tables. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.